Joining us today to discuss religion and the workplace is Carla Porter. Carla Porter works with organizations that want to achieve employer of choice status, are interested in attracting candidates who will develop into employee brand advocates that drive growth and continued success, embrace diversity, desire a culture of innovation with excellence, and want to enrich the community and reward superior performance with celebrity. Carla currently serves as Director of Program Development and Marketing for the ARC of Luzerne County, was the Director of Workforce Development and Human Relations for the Greater Wilkes-Barre Chamber of Commerce, and has served in the United States Air Force. Her professional blog can be found at carlaporter.com, and her personal blog can be found at personal.carlaporter.com. Follow her on Twitter at Carla underscore Porter and Facebook and Google+. Thank you for coming on our show today. Well, you're welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. So before we head into the workplace, <laughs> non-religious and even religious listeners of our podcast might wonder, should I put anything related to religion or anything pertaining to involvement in secular groups on my resume? I think that that's a fabulous question, and it comes up time and time again. Um, I always say, whether it has to do with religion, sports, extracurricular activities, if it doesn't have to do with the job you're applying for, don't put it on your resume. Obviously, if you were uh, going to pursue employment with a religious-based organization, then that could be in your favor if you were involved in something like that, to put that on there, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, just as if you were pursuing an accounting position and you put down that you were a member of Accountants of New Jersey or something like that organization, an affiliation. Uh, but if it isn't directly related to the position you're applying for, then I would not put it on. So something that employers might look for are leadership skills, community involvement. So in the case of a group like this, the NEPA Free Thought Society, would you think of putting something on if that were to be demonstrated? An employer shouldn't discriminate based on something like that. So if you were to put down that you were the chairperson or president of a organization such as this one, uh, it does show leadership skills, clearly. Mm -hmm. But when you mention the affiliation portion of it, which in this case would be free thought, uh, that in and of itself should not be, <clears throat> excuse me, an issue. However, we all know that individuals have biases, and that's the same reason why we prefer that people do not put their photos attached to their resumes or develop a resume with a, if you're artistic or creative, to put your photo on. That's happening more and more now also with so the advent of social media. People are able to see what you look like before they make a determination whether they want to pick the phone up and call you and phone screen you <coughs> because you look good on paper, um, as we say. Uh, so in regard to the affiliation with a faith or non-faith based organization, a philosophical based organization, I think it's important to take into account, do I want to take the chance from a personal standpoint of, ha of the individual who's going to view my resume uh, having a potential bias against what I am involved in. And the same thing could be for, uh, I'm going to talk about, the, I know that this is broadcast wide and loud and people all over the world can, can and do tune in and listen to it. But let's just talk a little bit about the area where we're in, which is northeastern Pennsylvania, okay. and say that it is not a highly diverse area in many ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we come to religion, uh, Christianity is the overwhelming winner in this area as far as faith is concerned Definitely. of our citizens. And so individuals who may be Jewish faith or Muslim or any uh, atheist, a any other type of life philosophy, um, if they hint toward that or put that on their resume, the likelihood that the individual screening their resume would have something in common with that is pretty low. Gotcha. So it's a gamble of sorts. It's a gamble of sorts. <clears throat> so I would say, from a job seeker perspective, you are want to do everything you can in your power to get that phone call, get that follow-up email, get that interview. So you have to put on your resume what you feel is going to most help you with those chances. And not turn them away from And you. not risk turning away. And it will be very difficult for you... We're such a litigious society, and I, that's going to come up. Litigation is going to come up probably time and time again in our conversation today where in regards to discrimination in the workplace. Um, but it would be very difficult 
to say someone looked at my resume and I was never called because I had on there about the Free Thought Society. That's so hypothetical. You could never judge why you have not been called. No. It would be much different if you got through the interview process and then something happened in the interview uh, that was based on that conversation that you could, that was clearly discriminatory and then you might have a leg to stand on. I'd have to assume that when you fill an application out and they ask you certain questions about what things you're involved in, you don't, once again, don't have to give them all that information. That'd be up to you and they can't hold it against you. If later on they were to find out you were in that position where you were head of an organization that they didn't agree with or whatever the case You're might correct. Be, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or they didn't have, uh, like you said, maybe litigation involved in it, they tried to That's pull that. That's right. One thing that people often don't uh, understand mm -hmm. is that a resume or a job application, unless it's a federal or a government job application, which is different standards from a regular application, mm -hmm. they want your curriculum VTA. They want the whole nine Easy. yards when it's for <coughs> government employment, but when it's for uh, civilian-based employment, really what your resume is a marketing piece about yourself. You're not under any obligation or compulsion to list what you don't want to on there. Okay. Okay? At the same time, you can't lie. So mm -hmm. um, if the application asks you, for example, if you've ever been convicted of a felony, you must say yes, because if you say no, first of all, that's in direct conflict with the terms of your Employer. agreement with the law, right? You're not allowed to lie about it. You have to you have to tell the truth, but also it would be considered a, lo a lie uh, on from the employer's standpoint, and they would never hire you. Character issue then. A character issue, yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So you mentioned about how it might not be a good idea to put involvement with atheist groups or anything like that. I, and I on, wouldn't put it involvement with Baptist groups or involvement sure. with any anything like that. Well, the, I personally would say The question that that leads into is how are, I guess, non-religious people supposed to be in a workplace that's overwhelmingly religious and when could employers cross the line with being overwhelmingly religious? The tr it's That's... Those are a lot. Those are a lot of questions, Justine. Well, let's let's try to pick it apart and get to them. Okay. First of all, I want to say that since uh, it, always in economic downturns, so whether it was the Great Depression or the recession that we're just pulling through right now, litigation increases. People are, um, for such a multitude of reasons, look to defend themselves and find out why they may not have been hired, they may feel that they were the best candidate, and they're going to look for any reason they can, and then they're going to seek legal counsel or file a complaint with the EEOC, which is, of course, the Equal the uh, equal Employment Opportunity right, Commission. So uh, that happens, and, that, and so there have been an increase in complaints filed with them throughout this past recession, also in the area of religious discrimination. Mm -hmm. In all areas, but that one too. So they've all increased for every reason. Lar mid to large size employers that actually have a human resource department or have on staff or retained legal counsel mm -hmm. are usually uh, pretty aware of how Title VII laws work, the regulations and rules work, and what is acceptable and not acceptable in the workplace in the area of hiring or even post-hiring, so throughout employment in mm -hmm. the workplace. Small employers, real small employers, usually are not versed or educated on it unless they happen to have specifically pursued that knowledge, of course. And so then you'll run into some areas there. But those rules and regulations uh, apply for employers that have 15 plus employees, not less. Okay. So real small employers or micro entrepreneurs um, don't necessarily have to go by those. In the workplace, um, most workplaces that have, at least have the HR department, they try to keep the workplace fairly, I would use the word sanitized, from that type of activity going on in the workplace. Clearly, when it comes to people who have articles of clothing or <coughs> grooming standards or symbolism that their religion or their faith requires them as a part of the faith to use or wear, I can state a yarmulke, mm -hmm. a veil, um, maybe some beards. Uncut beard. I was just because uncut beard. Um, in the case of Rastafarians, perhaps the whole head covering. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the form of it's like a hat, yeah. right? So those things are required by the religion, whereas in Christianity there is no 
obligation by the religion to wear an article of anything that identifies your religion. So even though people may choose to wear a crucifix in the form of jewelry, like on a chain or something, or earrings or whatever, it's not required by the religion for you to do that. So if a company has a policy against wearing jewelry, you can't say, well, I'm going to wear this because that's a representative of my faith, because that's not a requirement of your faith. Mm -hmm. If you're in a, and there are some really good cases out there, uh, Domino's now allows uh, Muslim women, they actually give them red and blue hair coverings, veils, okay. and allow them to wear a Domino's baseball cap. It's a logo, the regular old Domino's cap on it uh, in the workplace. Uh, Ikea has done the same thing. Ikea went out and said, we're actually going to provide these to our Muslim female workers, and they put their logo on the back of them. Wow. I never knew that. And branded them. And so what that ha what that did for the company was it, first of all, uh, didn't give the employees a choice as to the colors. They said, we're is standard issuing you this. Mm -hmm. And so if you want your head covered, your hair covered, then this is what you're going to have to use. And it, and it aligned with the faith principles, so it wasn't a conflict <clears throat> there. And then they said, and we're also going to get our bang for the buck by saying we're a diverse organization and we support diversity and we're going to show it to the point we're going to put our logo on it. Mm -hmm. So now it's interesting because some persons who work for certain organizations will claim it's their freedom of speech, say, to put up a message or a banner. And recently with the local cults controversy in Lackawanna County, there was a message on top of the bus that said, God bless America. And some bus drivers were claiming that it's their freedom of speech to put a message up on top of their buses, inside of their buses. So what are your thoughts on that? That's a really, a, I think, a, you've done something very unique with this situation. Um, in a typical workplace where people might have their own office or a cubicle, it's pretty standard that a person would be allow, allowed to have personal expression. So whether you wanted to have a little religious icon or a saying or a something, whatever it is, in your personal workspace, uh, that's used, that's not frowned upon. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's protected. But when you talk about a bus, the bus is actually the bus driver's office, right? If we want to look at it that way, the bus is the bus driver's workspace. Yeah. Workspace. Uh, however, that sign is not inward into his driver cabin, let me say, if he had a little God Bless America <clears throat> thing by his steering wheel or by on his notebook, right. on his dashboard, is a lot different than not being inside his work area and outside for public view, which is not the same thing. Inside the, inside the work area is more private. Yes. So, um... And everybody's going to see that. In fact, he can't see it from inside the bus because it's on the outside of the bus. <laughs> That's Am a good I point. Right? That's I mean, a good point. Not, you know, the, the way it was posted where the um, where the bus routes are supposed to go. So it's around the top at the front of the bus. So uh, basically, he he or they are using their company they work for to push their as a billboard. Their message. Yeah. As a billboard. Right? Mean, they, as an advertising vehicle. They're they using his employer as an advertising vehicle, mm -hmm. which would not be the same if you worked in a building. Let's say you worked in a bricks and mortar location and you wanted to display that message. And so you got a banner made and you went outside the building on the front of the building and you put it up on the workplace. Mm -hmm. How would that be viewed and who would allow that? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. What is someone, and I, you see, I, I kind of, um, when I was preparing for this uh, today for this, I thought to myself, I didn't really want to out or name employers, but I already did it with Domino's and Ikea, so I guess we'll, <laughs> we'll go on. But let's just say the XYZ general store, a grocery store, uh, one of the cashiers just said, you know, I want to put, I want to put an expression of my belief on the front of the store. Like, where would this be allowed? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the standpoint that I would look at it at with this whole, with this whole thing. Unless it was a private, privately owned business, and they said we have no problem with that. There right? are faith-based. That's another interesting topic. There are faith-based companies, it, right in the from the interview process on through the work floors and the work area, 
and on their brochures and their literature and on their website Perspective. and even on perhaps if they provide company logoed shirts or something like that they, they there may be a symbol on there and that's part of their whole state of being of the organization that's not hidden from the applicant mm -hmm. right that's very clear when you go right. apply there uh, apply there unless you haven't been paying attention at all like clearly have not been paying attention yeah but you'll learn about it soon enough if you've been if you're called for a phone screen or an interview that is not of course that is not illegal to do that it is not illegal to run your company like that you may choose to do that but what you cannot do is you cannot not hire a person because they do not have that same belief system and you cannot force the individual to practice any type of religious worship in the workplace with the groups of people that do that so if I'm being too vague if you have a company that has uh, religious ownership or management and they're and it's part of their image yeah. and part of what they do and let's say they hold Bible study for their employees every day at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you do not want to participate in that, they cannot make you participate in that. They cannot penalize you. They cannot separate you. And they cannot shun you in the workplace or treat you in a different way than they treat their other employees who do participate. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> When I say cannot, to. I mean they cannot according to the law. Yeah. So you're right. They're not supposed to. But you might notice a difference in their attitudes towards you once they realize mm -hmm. you're not on the same page as them a lot of times. It usually happens. They'll say, oh, we didn't know that you weren't, weren't religious. Why, you know, why are you standing over there? We're about to have prayer over here. <laughs> these, are the, these are the complaints then that end up being made when a person does feel isolated, a person feels harassed mm -hmm. in any way. That's when a complaint is typically filed. Or a person just quits their job and then goes to the unemployment office and says, I couldn't work there anymore because the conditions of the workplace were intolerable. No, no one hit me. No one stole my things. It wasn't that type of an Brandy. assault. Or, right, nothing like that. But yet, I felt so uncomfortable. I couldn't be there anymore. And that individual will file a claim, and of course when you file a claim for unemployment, you have to state why you left your job, what the situation, circumstances surrounding you leaving your job. And when you do something like that, typically an investigation will follow because they are required to read all those why people aren't at their job anymore yeah. and follow up. It's a lot different than we had no work and we downsized, right? That's not, that's not investigated, but something like this looks like it may... Uh, may have a reason for an investigation, and so typically they will. So what kind of what can constitute a hostile workplace? A hostile workplace could, for example, in this context that we're speaking about religion, would be if Rodney was constantly approaching or approached me and said, uh, take this tract or this literature or asks me if I've been saved or asks me if I would... Uh, go in a pray with private him. corner and worship, pray with him, or something like that, that in and of itself does not constitute harassment. It's my ob my own, it's my obligation to say, you know, Rodney, I'm not interested in that, and I don't want you to talk to me about that anymore. If Rodney agrees and that's the end of it, and nothing else ever happens, then we're fine. We're good, right? Well, I we're tried. Good. We're good. I tried. <laughs> That's right. It's like dating in the world. Right. It's like it's like sexual harassment, right? If you mm -hmm. approach me and you say, Carla, I you know, I'd really like to hook up with you or whatever, and I say, you know, Ronnie, no. I'm that's, rejected. that's oh. you're rejected. That's it. We're done. You know, we're gonna have I just want to maintain a professional relationship with you. And you respect that, we're good. Mm -hmm. We're good. But if you pursue that and you make me feel uncomfortable, guess what? We're not good. And that's when it's a problem. And it's the same thing with religion in the workplace. Or anything else, for that matter. Right, because when people go to work and they're employers, they have a certain task to do. To go to work, do their job, 
And if people are going to feel unwelcome at that point, then I guess that's where the problems would start. It right? affects productivity, right? First of all, when you don't feel good about your job, regardless of the reason, maybe um, there was an argument about whose duty it was to file these papers, or whatever the case may be, you don't leave with a good feeling about no. that, and it impacts your emotional well-being. But when we get to something about religion which is protected by our constitution it's a little it's more it's more it's a lot deeper than that and it actually ends up being uh, a real problem for the employer a real problem for the employer the employer is the one that's going to take the fall uh, on that if there's an issue because they're permitting that type of an environment and they're permitting those actions to go on without addressing them and correcting them mm -hmm. so for example if you continued on and I went and I complained, let's say Justin's the HR manager, and I go mm -hmm. to Justin and says, Justin, Rodney just won't stop. He keeps wanting to take me in the corner and pray with me. And I've told him time and time again, you know, I, I, I don't want him to talk to me about that anymore. I don't want him anything to do with that. And you, as the HR manager, said, Rod, Rodney's a good believer. Rodney just, you know, wants to save you, and, and you shouldn't have an issue with that, and and I don't understand why you're upset. Why would you be upset about something so harmless like that? So I think you should just let it go. go back to work and let it go. We've known Rodney for years now. He's great. Rodney's been a great employee <laughs> yeah. all these years. Why do you want to give Rodney any problems? Yeah. Like just let it go. And then and it continues, then then the employer is really the one that has the problem. Mm hmm Yeah. They should have stepped in and done something. They about should it. have stepped in and counseled Rodney and said, Rodney, this can't go on, and documented the conversations, of course, right, mm -hmm. for their own CYA. Right. And then had a follow-up with me and said, Carla, I spoke with Rodney, and I told Rodney he's not allowed, and if this ever happens again, you need to come and tell me so that we can take corrective action. That's mm -hmm. the appropriate way to, to do this. So what is some education, perhaps, that employers can have to reduce problems like this in the workplace? The first one would be during a new hire orientation. So again, really small companies don't always have an orientation. Sometimes you start a job and they say, put on this apron and get to work. Follow so-and-so around and get OJT on the job training. Mm -hmm. So that's one form of uh, what I would call onboarding an employee. Bigger companies that have the HR department and especially if they have uh, maybe more than one person starting on the same day or around the same time, they'll actually take you to fill out your employment paperwork and talk to you about the policies in the employee handbook. They'll have an employee handbook. Every company should have one regardless of how small they are, but they don't always. Uh, but these types of non-harassment policies should be in the, they would be in the employee handbook and they would be covered verbally and, and smart companies have you sign a paper that says I receive non-harassment mm -hmm. policy and I agree to adhere to it. It's contract. And, and then they keep it in your employee file and then if something comes up they pull it out and they say you violated an agreement that you signed. Mm -hmm. And then they can separate you for something like that. Right. If it's a big enough of a, an issue and then or if they've already counseled and coached you on it and gone through a progressive disciplinary process. And and if it's something really grievous, they could just separate you on the spot if it's something serious. And that can happen. If you hit someone in the workplace, that's like automatic to grounds for separation yeah. on the spot. There should be no it doesn't need to be any coaching and counseling <laughs> about that, right? You proceed to be a threat. Is it right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can definitely can't have that around. No. So, what are some issues that you've seen throughout your experience? Mm -hmm. I've had them. Uh, I have had individuals who uh, of the Jewish faith who wanted to not work on the Sabbath because they're observant, and so um, fortunately, where I have in places that I have been employed, uh, we were able to rearrange schedules and have that individual work those hours another time during the week. Okay. I have had a situation where uh, a woman uh, wore an abaya, and so, which is a, if someone doesn't know, it's a Muslim long garb that a woman wears, mm -hmm. and w need to work a machine. Oh. Okay, so she applied for a position where her dress um, 
could potentially be a safety yeah. issue. And you get caught up. Yeah, it could get in. caught up, right? Yeah. The, the, mm-hmm. Potentially. It could. <laughs> At least the fabric would get caught. And so um, I had the manager never ran into a situation like this. You know, I'm going to tell you that 10 or 15 years ago in this area, we really didn't have people walking around here. We didn't have a lot of Muslims here. No. And the and if you saw, you would rarely ever see a woman that was dressed like that. So it's becoming more common. And and so, so too are applicants or candidates in the workplace. So when it's a safety issue, like the manager had never run across anything like that and came to my office and said, what am I going to do? I, I think that this is going to be a problem. And if we have an OSHA issue, mm-hmm. you know, occupational safety hazard and all, mm-hmm. all that kind of thing, uh, what, what, you know, what am I going to do about this? She's qualified to do the job, but yet not wearing that. And I don't even know if I can ask her if she could take it off. They were afraid. They didn't want to get the company in trouble, they which is the did. right thing to do. It's the right thing to come and ask for counsel before making a... And they get the CYA. Action. Yeah, exactly, right? And so what we did was, um, in the end, we had corporate legal counsel, and it had to go all the way up through wow. corporate legal counsel. And in the end, uh, we made an accommodation that the room, we, we were able to put the machine in a room with no windows, so no one could see him, and it had a lock on the door. And so while she was in there doing her work, as long as she was with other women, it wasn't an issue, yeah. right? And in, it was only by coincidence that we didn't have men back there. It just coincidentally, there were no men back there doing that job. It was a mail processing, like postal mail processing area. And so as long as she was in there and the door was locked, she would remove it. And then when she was get ready to come out, she would put it back on Mm -hmm. in the workplace. And that was how we resolved that issue. She did understand. We told her. We tried to offer all kinds of things, like perhaps take rubber bands and put it around the garment around your wrist so that it wasn't, yeah, to keep it tight and things like that. We offered all types of suggestions, accommodations, and in the end it was a simple latch on the back of the door so that uh, she would feel comfortable that a man wouldn't walk through the door, and we were good. That's what it was all about, um, so they don't, um, a man doesn't always get to see them, and he doesn't lust. Uncovered, or, right, yeah. uh-huh, exactly. That's right. So a question that some non-theistic viewers might have is, is this really a level playing field? Because non-theists, and correct me if I'm wrong, can't claim an exemption from something because of their lack of belief. I suppose that theoretically they could, but what on earth would that be? I, it, nothing strikes me right now. In a, wor- in a secular workplace, a non, if, if you're not working in a church or you're not working in a religious environment, which you should know what you're getting yourself into if you don't want to be in that environment. I say don't apply in that environment, right? right. But, but uh, what would it be if you don't have any belief what in a secular workplace, a civilian workplace, would need an accommodation? If there was something, if you could sure. think of something. Oh, I have, then I have an example. Okay, go ahead. So suppose someone is a humanist and they believe that humanism leads them to a conclusion that animal testing is wrong or using animal products or making some kind of food is against their ethical code or something. So would that be able to really go anywhere? As if, uh, say, a Jewish person applied for a position, say, well, I don't want anything that's non-kosher, I don't want any to be involved with that. Would there be a level playing field there? I'm not sure that's ever been tested, Justin, in a, in a, in a workplace. It's a really good hypothetical question. I would say that in workplaces where there are uh, individuals who require kosher meals. The workplace either allows them to bring in their own food, of course, they can't force feed you, uh, or uh, orders, if it's a buffet or it's a company function where they're providing food for everyone, typically they will uh, go through and ask, does anyone need a food accommodation, whether that's vegetarian, kosher, nut-free, allergy-based, or something like that. And companies will accommodate or say you are free, of course, to, to, to bring in your own meal. When it comes to, let's say you are, you are a humanist and you go to work in an organization that um, uses chemicals and those chemicals are derived of a certain thing that you have a, an issue with or a personal conviction against, 
the company is not required to accommodate you. Um, here's the answer. The company is not required to accommodate you unless it causes le minimal or less inconvenience for business. Okay. That's when they're required to accommodate you. So if it's a matter of uh, you n need an area to pray and they have a unused area, a conference or a meeting room that you could go in there every day at the time that you need to and shut the door and pray, that's a really minimal inconvenience. That's really not an inconvenience or a minimal inconvenience to the company that they should have to source a new supply of that ingredient or perhaps there is like gelatin is gelatin, right? So if you if their product requires gelatin and you don't agree with the use of an animal derived substance, then that is not a minor inconvenience. They would stop have to stop production, source new ingredients, and so no you wouldn't be protected for that. You now we have some people in our live audience listening, uh, maybe mm -hmm. some people on Skype in the chat room. If you have any questions in the chat room or you'd like to call in via Skype, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, that would be great if there were some questions. What so, I can mm -hmm. say is that uh, I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready that your proposed billboard, the inoffensive right, billboard. Right, the atheist billboard. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to put a sign like that in your cubicle, and other individuals had some other types of symbols in their cubicles, you know, you could do that, and that should be viewed as equal. That shouldn't mm -hmm. be a question. Now, if you have a workplace that says, we do not allow signs, and if it's on your body because it's a part of your religion, like that head covering or that... Or maybe tattoos... And that's another interesting aspect, too, because some workplaces might not allow some certain tattoos. Some workplaces do not allow certain tattoos. Some places don't allow any tattoos. Some places don't allow piercings, except mm. for, say, your ears, right, with the traditional. Uh, the Church of Body Modification has not yet to stand, has not uh, stood up to my knowledge as being protected. So how far does it really go? Because one thing we talked about before were um, people of um, the Jain religion, Jainism, where they would wear a veil over their face so as not to inhale bugs or kill bacteria or anything like that. And can this person get certain accommodations in a workplace? Well, if that is part of what is required by their religion, they should be able to wear that mask or veil or whatever, the face covering, as long as it doesn't impair their ability to perform their job, then that shouldn't be an issue. Again, if it's just because, you, you know, and frankly, if you had a uh, personal conviction, let's not say this is religious, let's just say you had a phobia or you had a fear that bugs would get in if you breathed, then, and you wanted to wear a face mask, I think that an employer would make an accommodation for you to allow you to do that because now you're, you may even start taking a look at the ADA, American Dis Disabilities Act, or you may look that a phobia or a fear is a psychological, There, you know, you probably could get a doctor's note on mm -hmm. that one. Right. So that would probably not be an issue either. I would think that any employer would have that compassion, that you have that fear that you're not going to be able to perform your job, and so they would probably go for that. Where those where those things can run into situations are frontline, so it, there's called the look, like when you go in a, in a designer store where everyone has to be dressed the same, mm -hmm. the look. And we have them, right? Um, Abercrombie Fitch and things like that. And they've been litigated against multiple occasions by Muslim women, by the way, because they didn't want them to wear. Nobody's allowed to wear a hat. Nobody's allowed to cover their, wear anything in their hair in their store. Uh, and so they've, they've had multiple uh, legal cases with that. But... As long as you're able to blend that look in, so if it's a matter of colors, everyone wears blue in our store. All right, well, we'll get you a blue hijab and get you a blue abaya and get you a blue bug mask and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So now returning to the cults issue. Now we've seen in other, other states, counties, whatever, throughout the United States, that some bus drivers will claim, well, we don't like this advertisement on our bus. Now we're not going to drive it anymore. And there have been driver strikes, people refusing to drive the buses. So can they really have any steam, so to say, with that, if an atheist ad were to be put up on a bus? 
that's a very it's a very interesting thought as well if I were a bus driver and I didn't like uh, Pampers being advertised on the side of the bus or any other pro any product I don't want to pick I feel bad I said that name now but let's say diapers <laughs> We've been name dropping all the time yeah. example. let's say named diapers okay for example um, would I be able to say I'm not going to drive that bus that's not something that would be protected because the employer has advertisement for sale for products and services on the bus that's not your department. That's advertising's department, right? Wouldn't and affect your job either. Wouldn't affect your job. Oh, this is something we should have really touched on earlier, but it completely passed over me. We have the whole healthcare mandate, contraceptives, everything like that. So some persons who are working in pharmacies are claiming that it's against my code to prescribe contraceptives or anything, Plan B, stuff like that. So where they, can they what, really go with that? What they typically do is they are typically told by their employers if you don't want to fill that prescription give it to the other pharmacist who will fill it or refer the consumer to another pharmacy they lose business over that they can <laughs> they can and it, and it happens it's like doctors who will not perform abortions or nurses who won't assist uh, you can't require a person to do something that is against their religion. I would think that if you had a, a business and all your employees refused to uh, get some money, something they, they, they felt was uh, against their belief system or whatever the case is, that um, I guess they can't fire them, okay? Maybe they can't fire them for refusing to do that. But maybe they need to bring someone in specifically for that job. They can do it. They, they would, give, would they give it, it out. I mean, see, they wouldn't lose business that way. And I don't know, maybe the person is willing to go further and get the stuff out might get paid a little bit more also. If I were in, uh, an employer, and let's just pick the birth control pills, if I owned a pharmacy and uh, my staff of pharmacists were not willing to do that, I would bring in someone who would do it. Um, and again, maybe you're a Christian pharmacy. Maybe you have, you know, Christian Pharmacy Inc. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear, and you put in your window, we, we won't fill these prescriptions. Why would anyone walk through that door and try to get the prescription filled? Go across the street. We all have to get along, right? <laughs> I sense. mean, you're wasting your own time and and you're trying. You're pushing buttons, right? You're pushing buttons. Now, the ethos of pharmacy, though, some will argue, is that when you get into the job of a pharmacist, that you should know, as we said before in the podcast, what you're getting into. So, does that really have any clout? Can the employer say something like, well, you know, you applied for this job and we're very clear about this and that, that you would have to prescribe whatever the patient would want? Right. The uh, Again, the employer cannot force you to do something that's against your religion. What if the contract were to specify that you must X? Well, I, I guess that the man, let's talk about the manufacturers, manufacturers of contraceptives. And, and you're an individual who doesn't believe in contraceptives. They'll hire you there because you can do the job. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if you get hired and then you refuse to make the contraceptive, <laughs> you won't be fulfilling the duties of your job so you wouldn't be able to remain employed there unless they could accommodate you in an office job or in a janitorial capacity or something that wasn't the direct manufacture of the actual device, let's say, or medication. If you agree to that, some individuals would go as far as to say, I won't even work in a company that has anything to do with it, let alone make it. I don't even want to do the bookkeeping. Hmm. Then that's a personal choice you're making that you don't want to be employed there. So we're right. seeing. That's a personal choice. So you would need to resign or something like that. So what's the ultimate advice that you would have for employers and employees in matters of religion in the workplace? Employers who have a complete, there's this movement on of employing the whole person, and this has to do with work-life balance. So when you employ the whole person, you understand that the individual may have children, the individual may have health concerns, the individual may have outside uh, nonprofit organizations they're very passionate about volunteering for. And so when you employ this whole person, you're employing their passions and their personality and everything about them, not just their widget-making skills. Mm -hmm. And with that can come religion. And off, mo most times it's going to because most people 
have some. Yeah. So um, allowing individuals this expression, this thing where they support a particular nonprofit and maybe they have a award they got when they volunteered and they display it in their cubicle. Maybe you want to display a religious symbol. Maybe you want to display a picture of your favorite baseball team. Whatever turns you on. If it's that uh, and it's kept to just <clears throat> that, then most companies will go with that. So there are some larger companies who have huge, massive diversity initiatives. A lot of them are Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 300 companies, even some Fortune 500. And they really, they put up all kinds of affinity groups. So they have an internal within the workplace. They've got, it's much like college clubs. They'll allow an LGBT affinity group to meet on company time, on paid company time, or unpaid like lunch time or something. But they allow them to meet in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And the same can be with religious groups or Bible study or meditation or prayer or whatever the case may be. And they allow them uh, to form and they fund those groups. So if lunch comes along with the um, if lunch comes along with the Scrabble group, lunch comes along with the Bible group because fair is fair and they treat them all the same. So there are companies that do that. Companies that hire and maintain that type of culture in the workplace, the diversity heavily involved in diversity in the workplace, those tend to be happier workplaces, and we know that uh, there is less turnover in those organizations and people are. They, they grow a great affection for their workplace and for their employer, mm -hmm. and it tends to be a happier workplace and more productive. So I am in favor of diversity. I am in favor of uh, treating your employees as whole, whole people and allowing them to be who they are so that they are maximally productive. Mm -hmm. But there are employees, employers who have a blanket no to any of that in the workplace. There are no clubs for anything. No clubs, no independent uh, things going on like that. It's a blanket. You come to work, you make your widgets, and you're out of here. And we pay you in exchange for that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that either. But those will tend to be less happier workplaces, less productive and higher turnover. Hardline. Because hardline, they don't um, encourage or allow uh, a lot of employee uh, expression about life, that work-life balance portion. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Can you tell our viewers where they can find more about you if they have any further questions or if they want to be involved with what you do professionally? Absolutely. Uh, the easiest way to find me is carlaporter.com, and that's Carla with a K. Also, you can find me on LinkedIn, Carla Porter, and Twitter, as Justin said, Carla underscore Porter. Um, it's not difficult to find me. Google, type in Carla Porter. I'm going to pop up there. There are only a couple of us.